In this webinar, um, we will talk about common myths about foreign language, uh, how you can be the smartest person in the room uh, in a given conversation because of the knowledge that you've uh, accrued, not just about language itself, but about the world uh, through your study of foreign languages, which we're, uh, we're going to talk about which languages to study and why. <clears throat> and why. Um, how foreign language is ultimately about people. Now, I am, as Jay mentioned, I am former director of the Academy Tutorial in Nashville. I'm no longer director, but I still teach there as I teach my own online classes, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, and so, and I still believe in very high academic standards, but I don't believe that you have to sacrifice one for the other um, because even with a rigorous academic program, you can still instill in uh, a student the notion that this is not, not just about head knowledge, but it is ultimately about people. And I believe that the testimonials that you're going to hear will back that up um, over and over. So this is that slide that I described of my family. Um, we talk a lot about world and uh, as homeschool parents we want to make our children aware of um, of the world that they are going into but I'm afraid that sometimes we because of our own experience lack of experience or uh, prejudice cl uh, cloud that notion of the world by referring to it in negative terms terms and and calling it the big bad world sometimes tongue-in-cheek but um, I very much try to uh, impart to my students a love for the world, uh, an eagerness to get out and experience the world, the big, beautiful world. And that's why my wife, Becky, and I created a company uh, several years ago, over a decade ago now, called World to the Wise, obviously a play on words with word to the wise, be believing that um, it's one thing to go out into the world uh, and engage the world, but it's another thing to go out into the world equipped with the wise way to go about it. And this affects everything that I do from uh, leading cultural tours. My wife and I lead cultural tours primarily to, um, unfortunately, we've had to put those on pause both last year and this year for obvious reasons because of COVID, but we are chomping at the bit to take uh, students and their parents as well as adults to some of our favorite spots on the planet. And um, in fact, some of the people that you're going to hear from today are uh, not only former students of mine, but have traveled with us to amazing parts of the world, such as Paris, as you saw here, we have a group in Rome and incidentally, almost all of the students in this picture are homeschool students. Um, another branch of World of the Wise is the most relevant to this webinar, and that is my online school called World to the Wise Academy. So I, I, um, I opened this online school just a few years ago after teaching for many years uh, in person. Uh, French and Spanish. Uh, I've also taught world history. My wife and I developed a course together called Global Studies. And I've just seen such amazing results uh, year after year after year that I thought, what if we could multiply some of this goodness um, and make it available to people outside our city of Nashville um, and, and build even an international community of people who are not only uh, curious about language, but culturally curious. And that's kind of the tagline of our company. We're a home of the culturally curious. So uh, that's the purpose behind World to the Wise Academy. It's, uh, it's, it's designed primarily for homeschool families because uh, that is the um, context in which I have taught for so many years now. I used to give private language lessons when we lived in Europe and also here. I've taught in other contexts, but um, I just 
don't seem to be able to get away from homeschoolers because the ones that come to me in any case are the curious kinds. They're the kind uh, that want to be there. And in the classroom, it's just an incredible experience to actually have students say thank you on their way out the door after a class that we've had together. Now, I would like to, uh, at this point, address some misconceptions about foreign language because lo, there are many. So we're gonna talk about a few myths about foreign language. Uh, the first one is I don't have the gift. I, I wish I had a penny, not just a dollar, but a penny for the number of times I have heard uh, people say, um, mostly adults, but also students, um, I just don't have the gift for that. You know what? I get it. I don't have um, a gift for a lot of things. Do never You will never hear the word handyman and David Durham in the same sentence. And so I totally get that. But um, learning foreign language is not always about just whether it is a special talent of yours. Now, just want to, I'm not here to ruffle anybody's feathers, but I just want to uh, provide some perspective here. The are immigrants coming to our shores from other countries. They uh, have been coming. I, I should say we have been coming because I'm a, a white European. I am an immigrant. I'm, I'm a descendant of immigrants. Chances are you are too. But we have not stopped coming to this country. People still come by the thousands, a few less during COVID than at other times, but they do not stop landing on our shores. If you ask them if, if they were going to, uh, to learn English, well, you don't have to ask them. You assume, we assume that they're going to learn English. And uh, we certainly don't ask them if they are gifted in foreign language. For them, it's a matter of survival. And so the whole idea of talents, yes, it's hard to get away from that, but I'm afraid that it has kept way, way too many people from diving in and becoming at least conversant in a foreign language. Myth number two, um, my brain isn't built that way. So now in this, uh, in China, there are more people studying yours and my language, studying English than the entire population of the States. And so you might think, yeah, but you know, Asians, Asians are just smart, right? I mean, I've got Asian American friends and they are brilliant. I'm not going to argue with that. Um, but we're just going to do a comparison here. We're going to have a look at the brain and then a, a comparison uh, with the American brain. So here is a picture of the Chinese brain. Got that? Now here's the American brain. Mm -hmm. We have the same built-in inherent capacity. And we won't go into the anatomy of uh of the brain as far as language learning is concerned, even though it's fascinating. Uh, suffice it to say for now that you and I both have the same brain as the people you know who have learned our language as a second or sometimes third or fourth language. And another myth, the whole world speaks English. And we have relied on that, at least that misconception for way too long. If you have traveled internationally, then chances are you have expected people in the countries that you visited to speak enough English to communicate with you, unless you happen to be one of the infinitesimal percentage of Americans who speak a foreign language. And so, but, but one misconception about that is that only 20% of uh, the world speaks English as their mother tongue or even their second language. Now, it's true that there are far more, uh, far more than that who are learning it like we just talked about China, but we cannot let that keep us from learning another language ourselves. And the, the, the final myth that we're talking about today is 
I won't need a foreign language in my career. Maybe, maybe not. But um, obviously it depends on the career you choose, but let me just give you some facts. Studies show that speakers of another language have a distinct advantage in landing a job, even if it's not, if that job is not language based, as well as 10, for, 10 to 15% higher salary. US military personnel receive higher wages for knowing a foreign language. Now, a study in the UK showed that 60% of companies there uh, showed to be limited by language barriers when it comes to foreign trade. Um, in science, there is frequent interaction with foreign country, uh, companies and individuals. I'm coaching um, a young couple in Italian right now, and he works for an international company that actually is based in Italy. And so he is on the phone and in contact on a regular basis with Italians. Do they speak English? Mostly, yes. They have gone to that trouble. They have made that effort. But just think how how awesome it's going to be when my uh, friend who I'm coaching is able to carry on a conversation with them in their language. What a shift. What a, what a change, right, from the norm. If you're a writer, your writing ability in itself will uh, improve exponentially with your knowledge of at least another foreign language. And if you are in, in the running for a, a job writing or, or some kind of writer's competition, those qualifications will shoot you to the top of the list uh, because you will simply be writing better. Now, uh, yes, I'm a homeschool dad. We homeschooled all three of our sons in varying degrees. Only one of them homeschooled all the way through high school graduation. But uh, all three of them had their foundation as homeschoolers. And I participated in the education process um, along with my wife. Um, but when it came to teaching in a tutorial program, when I was first approached, about that, I have to admit I was skeptical because this tutorial only meets for classes one day a week. So you have 55 a week with, the, with those students. And I just didn't have any uh, experience teaching one day a week to homeschoolers. I, I just had taught my children and then private lessons. But I said, okay, I'll give it a shot. And I was proved so wrong. Now, obviously, the students have to be motivated. And I will say that that's pretty much the only kind of students that we have at this, uh, at this particular institution. And so I'm spoiled. But if you're a student or if you are the student and you're motivated, then you can absolutely do this. And I've got too many success stories now um, to, to prove otherwise. So we're going to hear from a few of these people, um, not in, not personally, but uh, through pe testimonials that they have shared with me. This is Max. Um, I have to say that when Max first came into my Spanish class, he was pretty much indifferent towards um, learning a foreign language. I mean, he's, he was a great kid, very upbeat, and he, it's not like he was resenting being in there, but he was just indifferent. He was just going to do the work. But uh, to, his, to his parents' surprise, he completely fell he head and heel and head over love with the, the Spanish language to the point that he now serves as uh, the interpreter for uh, mission groups going to South to uh, Central America uh, during the summers, and he's currently studying in college. And so this is what uh, Max uh, has to say: the one who came came in f went from uninterested to a fanatic. Learning to speak the heart language of my international neighbors has been the most powerful bridge for building relationships. To anyone who's been looking for a new way to reach out to those around them, look no further, learn a foreign language. 
This is Lacey. Lacey um, was just an incredible student. And as you see in her white coat, now she's a medical professional. Listen to what, to, to what she has to say. The ability to communicate in Spanish has given me more opportunities than most other gifts in my life. Most importantly, it has facilitated friendships with people from Mexico who are now some of my very closest friends and mentors. If I was not able to communicate in Spanish, I do not believe I would even have met these amazing women. The gift of Spanish has also given me the chance to work as a volunteer interpreter at Siloam Health, a free clinic for those without insurance. Very helpful in my clinical practice as a registered nurse to better understand and care for patients as well. I'm so thankful for the opportunities God has given me through this beautiful language, and I hope to continually grow in my competence, understanding, and appreciation of it. Now I'd like you to meet Laura. Her last name happens to be Griffith, which you may have noticed is the last of our moderator, Mr. Jay Griffith. Yes, Laura is Jay's sister. She says, my time spent learning French in high school and college helped me to expand my understanding of language and its relationship to culture as a whole. It also gave me so much more empathy for people who are learning English after coming to the States. I think those cultivated language learning skills serve me every day. And this is Sarah. Sarah is a uh, current student of mine. And Sarah says, I'm just going to have to paraphrase. Uh, she says that she is so uh, glad to have already learned. She's now in her fourth year of Spanish with yours truly. And she has seen time and time again, particularly as she travels with her family as well at her part-time job, how she's able to put Spanish to use on a regular basis and how people respond so positively, seeing that she has taken the time and effort to learn their language. And she says, I have no intention of stopping. So a lot of homeschool parents want to know what language should I start my student on? What languages should we learn? And some of you adults, uh, if you're attending this webinar just out of an interest in foreign language, you might be wondering the same thing. Now, before I start giving my own personal recommendations, and of course, this is my take, and you don't have to, you can take it or leave it, um, but just a few factors to consider. Um, do you have a sense of calling or a particularly a, a particular affinity for a, per, a peculiar group or people group or a language? For me, um, it started off as, um, I guess it was Spanish. Um, and I had an opportunity, I was a public school student, and I had an opportunity to, uh, to participate in a pilot program as a fourth grader during the summer, uh, I just took to it like a duck to water, uh, like a fish to water, I guess is the expression, um, and absolutely loved it. And I started learning Spanish, but then somewhere along the line, I decided I liked French better. And so I went to French. I eventually came back and, and picked up more Spanish in the process. Uh, if you go through that mini course that we are offering you for free as a result of attending this webinar, you will hear a little bit more detail about my personal language learning journey. So do you feel a, particularly, a, a particular affinity for a people group or a, a specific language? Where do you live? That's a, a very practical consideration. If you live in the United States, it is pretty much impossible to get away from the importance of learning Spanish. Um, I could give you some pretty startling statistics about how um, Spanish is growing as a language, as a second language in the United States. There are so many Spanish speakers here in the United States now that it is officially the second largest Spanish speaking country in the world, second only to Mexico. Nope, not Spain. 
So yes, it is a thing. And I could talk the rest of the webinar about how my Spanish comes in, uh, comes in useful on a, on a consistent basis. Um, as recently as a, work, a guy that was doing some work on our house who didn't speak much English at all, we were able to communicate just fine because I had that tool in my belt. Another consideration is what career are you considering? Now, this is obviously for older students. If you, you are a parent of um, elementary age kids, obviously you're not gonna pressure them with that question. You better start thinking about a career now. No, you follow their interests and you, uh, sometimes it's hit or miss. You present things to them and they respond and sometimes they don't. We'll talk in just a little bit about some resources for younger children. Um, there is also Latin. Now I've got some good friends that believe strongly that Latin is an essential foundation for, for uh, foreign language learning. Now, personally, I, um, I have a deep appreciation for Latin and have studied it some, but it is not the first language that I studied. I can absolutely agree that studying Latin um, is anything but a waste of time. It will give you an appreciation for modern language. It will give you an appreciation for classic literature. It will um, improve your ability to learn any other foreign language that you undertake after that. And so do I recommend uh, Latin as an important foundation? Yes, but not um, absolutely essential. That's my personal take. Um, some people find it interesting to go back and, and pick up Latin after they've been introduced to a modern living language. Obviously, Latin is not considered a living language. And so some people just write it off entirely. I do not. I believe it's an important tool that you can add to this broader picture. So Spanish, we said, if you're in the United States, that is a, a no brainer. It is, it is well worth your time to get at least a foundation in Spanish. French, which is my, the other language that I'm most prolific in, is um, an invaluable tool if you plan to have any kind of international involvement, and that doesn't have for your career or your or your job, but just if you want to become a global citizen, I highly, highly recommend French. Not to mention the fact that you can get around with French a lot of places, a lot more than just France. All you have to do is head northeast from the United States and you will see. Much of Africa is French speaking. There are um, many, many countries, uh, particularly in West Africa, but not only West, where French is the official language. And so, uh, again, depending on where your path takes you, it can be an extremely valuable language to know. If you're planning to get into business, especially if there's even the potential for it to be international business, Chinese is... Um, an incredibly valuable tool that you can put to use immediately in the workplace. And I would specify Mandarin Chinese, uh, which is by far the majority of Chinese speakers. Cantonese is pretty much just um, Hong Kong, uh, maybe just a few other isolated regions, but um, I would definitely go towards Mandarin over Cantonese. And then um, uh, one of my current students is now in her fourth year of French, and she blows me away. I'm going to go ahead and introduce you to her. This is JL. She is a, one of the best French students I've ever had, and her accent, her pronunciation is just mind-blowing to me. She sounds like it. she's been speaking it all her life, and she's just in her fourth year. But she took it on herself, during this path when her eyes were opened, not just to foreign language, but to the world that languages represent, she started learning Arabic on her own. And um, 
obviously she's motivated. And like I said, for this to work, you have to be motivated. But hopefully it's stories like this will, that, that will help in that motivation process. And that's one thing we talk about in the how to language mini course that you're going to receive for free is um, staying motivated by listening to other people's success stories. There's the same principle in every human undertaking. You can motivate yourself. You can be inspired by learning about, reading about other people's success. So uh, speaking of that, um, that mini course, you're going to receive a, a link that already contains a 100% off coupon code. And so you uh, will, like Jay said, you'll receive an email that has that link and it will take you straight to this particular course, How to Learn a Foreign Language, Seven Hacks for Making the Daunting Doable, the foundational course inside World to the Wise Academy. Now, um, in that, we just talk about a few very, very key um, aspects of learning a language that if you pay attention to them on the front end, it will save you some heartache, um, some hair tearing, and um, throwing things against the wall. Because yes, it is a challenge to learn another language. I'm not here to say otherwise. But mindset is huge. And we have a collective mindset to overcome, as I mentioned earlier, and that is that we Americans or we English speakers are just not really great. We don't have the gift. We're just not really great at learning foreign languages. And these people that I am referring to, these uh, students of mine are, are here to prove otherwise. So mindset is so important. This is, this is a man who inspires me, Albert Einstein, who never made a mistake, never anything new. Now, this is Nate. Nate is also a current student of mine. He's in his fourth year of French. When, when he first came in, he was, um, he was eager. He was curious and, and ready to learn but he just made mistakes all over the place. And still when he's speaking um, or writing, he, he does both very, very well, but he still makes mistakes, but that's not holding him back. Um, and if we're, we'll talk in, in just a minute about perfectionism and that, that is really an enemy of getting out and actually doing it. Now, Thomas Edison said, I've not, I'll have just 10,000 ways that won't work. And so it's really important to, to see that it is possible and goal setting is a very important part of that. Now, this is, uh, this is a picture that I found some time ago that I think really speaks to us as English speakers. Um, we English speakers, and um, yes, I'm speaking primarily to Americans, we have this unspoken notion that we are the center of the universe. I mean, of course we would never say those words, but we live as if that were the case. Everything has to um, revolve around us, whether it's people learning our language, like we've already talked about, people understanding us, etc. cetera. Uh, and so anyone who, uh, who doesn't speak English very well, we can either make fun of, as it says in this sign, or look down on, get frustrated with, irritated with, et cetera. But just the perspective that this, um, that someone had the wisdom to put on this marquee, um, I think is an important lesson for all of us. It means they know another language. Uh, English is not their first language. It means that they are making the effort to learn someone else's language. Now we talked about perfectionism. I try to, um, to tell, well, my children and then into my classrooms, whether online or in person, um, teach the difference between excellence and perfectionism. Excellence is simply bringing your best, period. It is not going to be perfect unless you're the exception to our race that I've never met yet. Ex excellence is just simply bringing your best. Perfectionism um, will get you nowhere. You will be 
simply less happy. You will be uh, frustrated. You can easily get angry with yourself. And the ironic thing about perfectionism is that our focus remains on ourselves. Whereas what we're talking about is about relationships with other people, making an impact in the world through, through taking steps toward building bridges toward another person or other people. If you are caught up in perfectionism, you are self-focused, which is self-defeating. We've already talked about getting inspired by other success stories. Another tip we give in this uh, mini course that you're going to receive is immerse yourself. Now, you might just be rolling your eyes and thinking, yeah, right, I live in Alabama. Um, not a lot of uh, French speakers here, if that's what your target language is or whatever. Obviously, within our limits, I don't expect you and your family to up and move to a Spanish speaking country, for example, in order to learn Spanish. Although if you do have a way to do that, I say more power to you, it's awesome. But I simply mean by this, um, taking advantage of every opportunity to put you in contact with that language that you're learning. This can have take so many different forms, putting post-its around the house with the, let, let's say that Spanish is your target language with the Spanish word for every object in, in the room, uh, just so that's, in, that's present in your mind at all times. Um, listening to music in your target language, watching videos in, in Spanish, watching movies with Spanish subtitles. Um, you know, I've, I've learned a good bit um, of, in a number of languages by doing that very thing. In fact, I'm a little bit obsessive about that. I just love, oh, Go rewind a little bit. I didn't catch his word for or whatever. Um, and then, there, of course, there are apps uh, such as we're, we're all aware of uh, Duolingo. There's a great Spanish one called Coffee Break Spanish. Now, a lot of people often ask me what I think about these as, as far as language learning tools. I would call these supplements. I would not expect to learn a language and when I say learn a language, I mean to be able to carry on a, at least a basic conversation, not just read, learn to read signs, although that's valuable in itself. But I would call these supplements to something a little bit more rigorous, a little bit more substantial, which we will talk about more in just a minute. Um, arrange your living conditions um, in such a way that are conducive to learning. Um, it can be even um, small detail things like setting the language of your devices to your target language, um, assuming that it is one of the options. Of course, Spanish and French are certainly those options. Um, and then there are online tools like, like Quizlet uh, that have flashcard functions and you can play games and, and quiz yourself, etc. So many different resources. Sources, um, not to mention perhaps the most important way of immersing yourself, and that is look for humans in your community who speak that language. Most cities in the United States, and I'm not just talking about major cities, small towns now have significant Spanish speaking populations. It takes very, very little effort for most Americans to find native Spanish speakers, who some of whom, not all, some of whom though, will be willing to help you on your language learning journey. And then uh, another online tool that I still use today to um, keep up my conversation, conversational skills is italki, I-T-A-L-K-I.com. Um, and you can, for very reasonable prices, find a native speaking conversation partner and have online conversations with that person as often as that person is available. It's been really, really great for me. So this whole process has with opening yourself up to different. Now, there's so much that we could say about this, but you have to take the, uh, the conscious step 
because it's not it's not always going to happen automatically the conscious step of acknowledging that let's say french you're going to learn french french is not a version of english french is not um uh somebody's idea of uh of converting english to their language french is a language in and of itself and so you have to you remember the old floppy disks in the computer? Some of you younger ones don't even know what I'm talking about. It's like taking out the English disk and inserting the French disk or the Spanish disk or whatever, learning to look at it through uh, new eyes. So as we come uh, near the close, keep your eye on the prize. What is it that is waiting for you? And I love to, to think in these terms. Uh, um, sometimes you can imagine that there is a group of people or a single person, a special friend, maybe even your eventual marriage partner, um, who's waiting to meet you, and it might not happen unless you uh, take these steps to learn that language. Or what amazing career opportunities are awaiting you? What um, travel opportunities are awaiting you? Just whatever it is that you aspire to, keep that in front of you. So where to start? We've already talked about the online uh, mini course that you're going to receive for free, but um, I want to be um, clear that my primary um, audience is homeschool families of junior high and high school. So um, if you are the parent of younger kids, I encourage you, I urge you not to wait until it's a requirement for graduation to start thinking about foreign language. There are many, many, many uh, different um, tools online and otherwise to get you in that process, to get you in that habit of broadening your children's scopes, broadening their horizons from the beginning. And at the Top of the list is books, books, books. The library is your best. I don't have to tell families that, but the library is so full of, of uh, resources for younger children to introduce them to the foreign language and therefore to introduce them to the big, beautiful world. Um, but there are tons of online learning um, tools. And I'll just mention a few if you're taking notes. Uh, or Jay, it, maybe you might be able to drop these, type these into the chat. One is called Little Pim, that's P I M, littlepim.com. And this is uh, primarily for children ages one through six. They have a free trial. It is a paid program, but they have a free trial available. Um, so that's littlepim.com. Then there's another one called dinolingo.com, D-I-N-O-L-I-N-G-O.com, uh, for children ages 2 through 12. Uh, there's one called digitaldialects.com. That's digitaldialects.com. And also, if you go to the New York Public Library website, they have a number of uh, recommended resources or um, helping younger children learn foreign language. And so, like I said, most of the things that I do are geared uh, to stu homeschool students, but anyone, I've got adults that have taken these courses as well. I think maybe even some of the adults are on this webinar with us today. Um, there's my foundational language, how to learn a foreign language. And, and that is just um, a total of about 90 minutes uh, in all. But I don't recommend that you do it all in one sitting. I, I recommend that you split it up into chunks. And it consists of 14 short uh, videos and then recommended resources. So the other courses that are available in World to the Wise Academy are Introduction to Spanish for Real Life. My language courses have the tagline for real life for a reason. Yes, uh, I have very academic standards. You should come out of my courses prepared for any college or university and hopefully even clip out of some hours. Um, 
I specifically recommend this intro class. It's um, it's 19 lessons plus a resources module. I, I recommend this for seventh or eighth graders, or if your student is in ninth grade and still hasn't started a language, um, then a great place to start. And I'm going to be offering uh, an online class using this curriculum in Intro to Spanish for Real Life this coming summer, and you'll see information about that in your email as well. So if there's a Spanish, there's also a French intro to French for Real Life. Same thing, it's about 20 lessons, uh, includes a beginner's guide to French pronunciation. It includes a little, um, a little module on typing French characters. And like I said, I will be offering an online class uh, for homes, well, for anyone uh, this summer in intro to French. And so just speaking of those intro classes, you could totally imagine doing my intro class over the summer and having your student be completely prepared for first year high school French or Spanish in the fall. And that would be a seamless uh, transition. And speaking of first year high school Spanish, I am developing a um, Spanish for real life year one that's um, good for high school credit, one year's high school credit. And that will be available in August. And so for the 21-22 school year, that will be available as a follow-up to the intro to Spanish for real life. And then we've also got um, uh, a mini course on Spanish for short-term missions. Thousands of of young people leave these shores every summer, maybe not this summer, but we'll see, um, to head south of the border on either mission or humanitarian trips. And this is a really handy practical uh, guide to put some Spanish under your belt in communicating with the people that you're going to serve. Then we have French for real life year one and year two. These are good for high school credit. And um, I'm in Tennessee. In Tennessee, you have, to re you have to have two years of the same foreign language to graduate uh, from high school. And then there is a bundle option where you can get a one year all access subscription and um, with monthly payments that will get you access to literally any and all courses inside World to the Wise Academy. So, I mentioned this summer I'll be offering Intro to Spanish and Intro to French. I'm also considering offering, uh, offering a Spanish one and French one review, two separate classes, of course, um, for, for students who just finished their first year. And um, let me tell you, if you don't already know this, that second year French and Spanish in high school is a, a bit of a challenge. And it's primarily characterized by learning multiple verb tenses. So we just learned a couple in first year. Second year, there are a lot of important meaty things waiting for you. And so um, I'm, I'm thinking that I could provide a really valuable service by doing a recap of Spanish one and, and French one for students preparing to go into their second year of high school, French or Spanish. So. This is another former student of mine named Will. And here, here is what he has to say. When I hear someone speaking Spanish, it is an opportunity for me to try and honor them by speaking their language in the same way that they honor me by speaking, to, by speaking mine. It also gives me an immense appreciation for the college students I meet who speak four to five languages. It allows me to appreciate that they had to put a lot of time and effort and bravery into learning to speak my mother tongue so it would honor them to show that I have done the same. What a perspective. What a rare perspective, if we're honest. Will says, I would encourage a starting student by saying that though it can be difficult and takes a lot of bravery to go out and speak a foreign language to someone, it is honoring to them and a rewarding thing to be able to address someone in their own language. So take the time now, put in the effort to learn the language well, because it will be worth it. Couldn't have said it better myself. So we've talked about how it makes you more globally aware more culturally intelligent, makes you a smarter traveler. And if you um, 
if you indicate an interest in our tours, then you'll receive updates as they come available for the next World to the Wise cultural tour. Love to have you. Um, it makes you understand your own language better, as one or two of these testimonials have said, and it will lead you to a wealth of diverse relationships. And now, if those aren't super, I don't know what is. Um, and I, I really think that you will find the, the same to be true. Those, some of you are listening and have already experienced that um, enough to know it's true. So let me close with a personal story. I, um, as Jay mentioned, lived a number of years in Europe. Uh, a couple of those years was as a single, and then my wife and I spent uh, 10 years in two different countries in Europe. Uh, we moved to uh, Switzerland primarily to be part of a French-speaking music ministry that is part of an international missions organization. I'm a musician as well as a language freak, and uh, I had already begun writing and recording in French uh, and touring in different uh, French-speaking areas, but as a solo artist. So when, I'm, when we moved to Switzerland and became part of this team, I met up with the guy whose picture you see in, um, that's not me, <laughs> his name is Francois. That's his wife, Christine. When I met Francois, he spoke a word of English. He, he was a native French speaker. Um, I knew that we were going to be working together. And so it was gonna be pretty important for me to to get along with him, to get to get on well with him. Um, it also became quickly apparent to me that Francois had a bit of a chip on his shoulder um, regarding Americans. I think he had had some unpleasant experiences with Americans. It happens. Um, and so I had a bit of a challenge in front of me. I think it's safe to say that if I did not speak French when I came into this relationship with him, uh, that what you see on this screen would not have happened. And that is a musical collaboration with Francois and Christine. We recorded an album together called Face à Face, means face to face, in case it weren't obvious. And, um, then, and then another one, and then another one. And to the point where I enjoy singing with the two of them. To this day, I enjoy singing with them more than singing as a soloist. And we have become inseparable friends. And I just simply don't believe that that would have happened if I were uh, what is often considered the typical American who comes in expecting everyone to speak his or her language and relating to him in the American way on a cultural level. So this is just one of the ways that I am a richer man uh, sitting before you today because of these experiences, venturing across bridges into incredibly rewarding, yes, difficult, yes, challenging, but incredibly rewarding um, experiences. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Jay. Uh, this is my website here, daviddurham.org. You can reach me at david at daviddurham.org anytime. I would love to hear from you. And Jay, I so much appreciate this opportunity. Well, I'm so, we are so happy to have you here. Um, we are going to go ahead and open the floor up to your questions. We've already had a few come in, um, but if you would like to use the Q&A functionality to ask David any questions, um, now would be the time to do that. So I'm going to go ahead and ask you, we have a couple here from Olga Mills who asks, Hi, thank you for helpful advice and tips. What do you think about learning to write in the foreign language the kid is learning? My son has two native languages, Russian and English. He's learning Spanish and Chinese. I'm teaching him to write in his native languages, but we have not started writing in the foreign languages. I can see him writing in Spanish, but Chinese is so much harder. What are your thoughts on that? That's a fantastic question, Olga. And, um... By the way, congratulations, my, my hat's off to you. Just the fact that your children are being raised um, in a multilingual is just such a wealth, such a, such a, um, yeah, a wealth of experience for them, even though they may not realize it yet. 
Um, I would say that that the, um, it is probably more important for your children to be conversant in those languages, but it also depends again on um, what you would like to see as one of the byproducts or the results of them knowing this language. Um, if, if the child is going to go into business and will need to be able to read and write Chinese, then yes, eventually do that. But I wouldn't rush that. I would try to um, get a pulse of their, with, of their rhythm, what they're comfortable with, with encouragement and kind of use that as your guide. Um, but I, I wouldn't rush that. If I don't, I don't like having read or write, speak or understand. But if I had to choose, I would say speaking over writing, especially when it comes to a language like Chinese. The day may come when there is a specific opportunity for them to learn to write in Chinese and absolutely take it, but I wouldn't rush it. Awesome. Um, we have one more question from Olga who asks, um, my son speaks Spanish fluently, correct endings, verb forms, word order, etc. But we have never covered formal grammar in Spanish, though. My son is nine years old. Do we need to cover formal grammar at some point? If so, at what age should we do that? Another great question. Man, we've already got some families on here. It's clear that are well on their way in this journey, which is exciting. Um, a nine-year-old... Um, I would say kind of the same thing, uh, and that is don't rush the formal grammar for a nine-year-old. Um, I think it is fantastic that he already speaks um, fluent Spanish, and if he is using incorrect grammar, that will become um, that will become a, a more of an issue later than it is now. When he is uh, older. I would say take the opportunity to teach him formal grammar, but don't rush it. I would think you can probably wait till at least junior high age uh, to, to, to teach him why we say things in Spanish the way we do, which is what grammar is about. It's why we say things the way we do. Good deal. We have three questions about from, all from different people about classes. Um, Number one is, do you, do you have English courses for kids or resources for English courses that you recommend? Um, the short answer is no. I, I don't teach English to, to non-English speakers. And uh, well, I don't teach English, period. Um, and I have not spent um, much time and energy looking into ESL resources. But if you will send me an email, I can put you on a path. Um, in fact, I happen to know someone who's, who, whose brother is your moderator, who has experience in te teaching English as a second language. And between him and other uh, friends and resources, I can come up with a path to set you on. But no, I do not teach English. Um, a second question, and I, I think I already know the answer to this one, but Angela asks, are we as parents able to do the courses as well? Oh, absolutely. The answer is yes. Nothing would make me happier, really. Uh, for a, a parent to do it with their child is a, an absolute win-win. And not to mention doing it with their child, the courses are also relevant to adults as well. Yeah, and like I said, I think we have one or two adults on this call who have gone through my courses themselves. Mm -hmm. When I say they're tailor-made for homeschoolers, it's just because apart from the intro classes, which are a little shorter, as I said, the others the high, are based on a high school school calendar. So 32 weeks of content, which is your average um school, public school, private school, school year length. And, um, and that's why I say they're good for high school credit, but absolutely anyone can take them. I've got lots of adult learners. Awesome. Um, we have a question here from Tiffany who asks, my daughter has dyslexia and other learning disabilities. She struggles with reading a lot 
Is it reasonable to start with verbal language now or should we hold off longer? She is turning nine. She's turning nine. Well, verbal language can uh, can be a little bit bit of a, a little bit of a vague term. I'm not quite sure what you mean by that, but if you mean by that oral language, then I'd say start yesterday on oral language. And I should say O-R-A-L as well as A-U-R-A-L. Get them, get them seeing visuals and hearing it and not worry too much about reading it. Um, in fact, that's a great way to start any kid, you know, um, with, with whether they have learning disabilities or not. So I would say start immediately um, exposing them visually and orally, A-U-R, um, to the language as, as soon as possible. And let that be it for now. Awesome. Um, well, we've got several people saying thank you for the webinar and let me express that as well. Thank you so much. Oh, you know what? We have one more. Let's go ahead and get this one more question in. This is from Amy who asks, I teach a once a week German class to high schoolers in a school for homeschoolers. This is my first year to do so. I too was skeptical about how this would work. What type of homework requirements slash vocab study requirements do you give your students to do from home since they we only meet once a week? Great question, Amy, and my hat's off to you as well. Um, I generally stay within um, a guideline that the student should not have to spend more than four to six hours a week total on any one subject. Uh, and that's whether they are completely self-taught like as a homeschool student or whether they're taking a class from a tutorial like the one you teach. Um, and so I curate exercises and assignments for them that I think touch on everything that I have taught for that week, give them a chance to practice those things and I generally try to, uh, to include at least one enrichment type um, assignment, whether it's reading about something cultural or uh, watching a video about a cultural aspect of the place where that language is spoken, in your case, Germany, Austria, et cetera, Switzerland. And um, so I would try to keep it to about four hours worth of assignments. I have... Um, relied heavily on public school curricula to draw from and the curricula that I have created and am creating myself um, is largely based on public school models because because those are tried and true some are better than others I just um, kind of chew the meat spit out the bones and and curate uh, assignments that I think cover all the important things as well as give them some enrichment opportunities along the way within that estimated time framework of four to six hours a week, including their, their class time with you. I hope that helps. Feel free to email me if we need to continue the discussion. Awesome. Well, if there are, are no other questions that people would like to ask, um, yeah, I'd like to express again, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, if you would like to check out all of the rest of David's courses, you can find them uh, through his website on daviddurham.org, which he has here. Um, but as we stated, you will also be getting an email with the foundational course within it. Um, David, is there anything else that you'd like to say before we hop off here? Just thanks again to everyone for hanging in there with us. I hope I didn't get too long-winded. You can tell I'm a little bit um, passionate about this stuff but uh, feel free to email me with any further questions or comments. Awesome. Well, thank you everybody so much. Um, may your week be blessed and we'll see you again soon.